In this lecture, I'm going to review a number of different uh, what we call modifiers of stress, different things that can modify the stress response. In our last lecture, kind of where we left off, we were talking about how cognitive appraisals, those primary and secondary appraisals, the way one thinks about the source of the stress, the nature of the stress, and oneself in that context as far as coping resources and abilities, how that's a modifier of stress and helps us understand how some people respond differently to what looks like a similar stressor. Today we're going to talk about a few other types of modifiers that also can highlight the, the reasons why people respond differently to stress and some of the things that can um, buffer the stress response or make stress easier to cope with for some individuals. One of those modifiers that's very important is social support. Uh, we've known for decades now from lots and lots of research that social support is such an important uh, factor in uh, how we manage and cope with stress. Uh, social support is defined as the caring, comfort, the connections, or help that might be provided by other people or groups. Uh, it turns out that social support is a lot of different things all at the same time. Um, so it's kind of hard to talk about social support globally, but that's what we're going to try to do in our brief review here today. At least three ways that we can think of social support as being sort of uh, broken down in different categories is social support can be emotional, tangible, or informational. Emotional support is that caring that you might experience, empathy or positive regard, encouragement you get from people. Relational and emotional types of uh, supports are emotional social support. You may also get tangible social support. That may be direct resources or assistance, uh, help that somebody provides, resources that they give you that might make it easier to cope. And lastly, informational support. This would be things like advice, suggestions, or feedback. I'll give you an example from my own life. Uh, several years ago, my oldest daughter, who's now uh, in high school, um, actually had cancer when she was three years old. Very, very stressful time um, in the life of me and my family uh, as we were going through that time of about two years of treatments and surgeries and all of the stuff that comes along with uh, uh, fighting cancer. Well, during that time, we experienced a lot of social support in all three of these areas. Certainly, we got lots of emotional support. Um, people would check in on us, just encourage us. Um, some people, uh, one person who we don't even know, arranged a card shower for my daughter and our family where we got all kinds of just cards of encouragement and thinking of you uh, from people we didn't even know, hundreds of cards that people just wrote in to say, we're thinking of you, uh, we're praying for you, um, and that was a very uh, helpful emotional support during a, a stressful time. We also got lots of tangible support. Um, several people gave us uh, gas cards as gifts so we wouldn't have to bur have the burden of the expense of gas of going back and forth to Oklahoma City uh, for treatments. At that time, people still used phone cards. This was in the age just when cell phones were kind of starting, and so people needed phone cards to make long-distance calls. Um, that was very helpful. People would bring us dinners, either homemade dinners when we were home or bring us catered dinners when we were at the hospital. So those kinds of tangible effects that made the stress easier to cope with. And lastly, we certainly relied on a number of people for informational support. Um, in the Department of Psychology, one of our faculty, Dr. Larry Mullins, is an expert in how families cope with cancer. So he provided uh, me and my family with lots of great information and strategies and ideas of how to cope with a really challenging situation that, of course, was so unique we, we didn't have a lot of ideas of how people cope with that. And that kind of information and expertise was very, very helpful. So that's an example of those three different types of social support and how they can be useful. Sometimes we get social support that doesn't match what we really need. Um, sometimes what we really want is emotional, self, uh, emotional social support. We want somebody to understand what we're feeling, to communicate that they care and they, they get our experience. But the person delivers to us tangible or informational support. They try to solve the problem or offer a solution, and that's not really what we want. So sometimes the support isn't matched very well to what people need, and to the extent to where it matches what people need is typically going to be more helpful. There's two different kinds of hypotheses that we can make about what social support really does to help people cope with stress. One of those hypotheses is called the buffering hypothesis, and that's illustrated by the figure on the left. 
The buffering hypothesis presumes that under periods of low stress, social support doesn't really matter. It's kind of irrelevant in terms of its impact on our well-being. It's, it's fine, but without a stressor, we don't really need it. The buffering uh, hypothesis says, though, that at periods of high stress, when we're facing major stressors, that's when social support really makes a difference and helps uh, buffer that stressor from impacting our well-being. Said another way, people without social support suffer more in coping with the stress than people who have high social support uh, because the social support is a buffer. That's the buffering hypothesis. Another hypothesis is what's called the direct effects hypothesis. Direct effects hypothesis simply says more social support is better all the time. So whether you are experiencing low stress or high stress, you're better off having uh, a strong social support. I think the truth is, and the literature is a bit mixed on this, but I think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. That high social support probably is better all the time, um, but it's probably more better. It probably has a bigger impact under periods of high stress. So I think probably the truth is somewhere in between these two hypotheses. Another important modifier of stress is personality, and this is of course a major source of individual differences. Personality can be thought of as those relatively consistent ways that people think about situations and respond to situations. That's one way to think about personality, rather than thinking about it as like traits that people have, something within them that drives their behavior. We just tend to think of it, um, or, or one way to think about personality, is that it's just a relatively consistent way that people respond to, to similar situations uh, across time and across contexts. There's a couple personality styles in particular that are known to be particularly vulnerable to stress and the effects of stress. One is called Hardy Personalities by a, a psychologist named Suzanne Kobasa. People with hardy personalities are defined as people with a high sense of personal control and self-efficacy, so they feel like effective people. They have a sense of commitment and purpose. They know what they're doing and why they're doing it, and they have a focus to their life. And they tend to view stress as a challenge, as kind of uh, challenges to overcome, not necessarily threats. Individuals with hardy personalities tend to have different health outcomes, better health outcomes, under similar stress compared to people who don't have hardy personalities. A second type of personality is what's called the type A personality. This was originally uh, defined by a couple of cardiologists, Friedman and Rosamond, uh, years ago. They had noticed that there was a certain type of patient they observed. And the, the story goes, I honestly don't know how true it is, but the story is that they noticed that the chairs in their lobby were always worn out on the front edge, but the backs of the chairs never wore out. And what they hypothesized was that there was something different about the people they were seeing with the heart trouble, um, and they labeled that type A personality. They defined the type A personality as people who are highly competitive, they have a sense of time urgency, they're always on the go, always seem to be in a hurry, and they're quick to anger and hostility, um, sometimes called a vigorous vocal style, we might call obnoxious uh, here in Oklahoma. Um, these are the type of people that Friedman and Rosamond were observing were sitting on the edge of their seats. They were literally on the edge of their seats in the doctor's office and wearing out the fronts of the chairs. It turns out after years of research, it looks like the anger and hostility part of this constellation is the most important contributor. Frequent experience of anger and hostility is bad for one's body. It's bad for one's health. Um, it probably is correlated with low social support because these people don't tend to attract a lot of support and friends. Um, but it looks like anger and hostility is, is generally bad for one's health and makes stressful situations worse. The last uh, concept I'll point out that can be a modifier of stress is an experience called learned helplessness. This was defined by a psychologist named Marty Seligman years ago and has been studied for decades in research. Learned helplessness is one particular way that people could respond to unpredictable stressors and it tends to result in poor outcomes, both in health and mental health in terms of the experience of depression. Learned helplessness is a result of how one makes attributions or explanations for the causes of stress. 
When one experiences stress in their life, they can make a number of different attributions. One is they can determine, is it internal versus external? In other words, was it about me? Is this something bad that just happens to people like me or something about me that brought it about? Or is it external? Is it just fate or circumstance or just uh, bad luck uh, that brought about this stressor? That's internal versus external. People can also make attributions based on whether they're stable or unstable. Stable attributions are, this is the way things are now and forever. Things are not changeable. Unstable are the people who say, yeah, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Tomorrow's a new day. We'll see what tomorrow holds. They tend to be more optimistic about things may change in the future. That's stable versus unstable. And people can make uh, attributions based on the dimension of global versus specific. Global refers to whether this stressor reflects something uh, sort of globally true about me or the world. This kind of thing always happens to people like me is a type of global and internal attribution. Or is, this, or is this a specific situation that is unique to this particular stressor uh, that, oh, I understand why this is happening now um, and why this is happening to me. People who tend to make internal, stable, and global attributions when faced with stress are more prone to learned helplessness and therefore more prone to uh, the damaging health effects and depression under stressful conditions. So somebody who faces a stressor and thinks, ah, oh, this type of thing always happens to me. It's always going to happen to me. Nothing good ever happens for me. And this is just the way the world is and the way the world always will be. Um, you can imagine that's not a particularly ideal set of attributes to make when faced with a stressor. People who respond to stressors as, oh, this is unfortunate um, and unique but it's probably temporary, and if I make some changes, I can experience different things. And that this is really a one-shot-in-time kind of deal, and tomorrow may very well be different, um, those people are going to cope with stress differently and have better outcomes. So that completes a brief lecture on some of the important modifiers, social support, personality, and learned helplessness on stress. Uh, next, we will turn to the effects of stress on the body and on health outcomes.